Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the 2017 Moot Bay Dean Competition, and thank you to everyone who is here today and watching via the live stream. Before we begin the competition, we're going to ask everyone to shut off their cell phones so we do not interrupt any presentations. We are in the Abella One Division. The teams competing in this division are American Hebrew Academy, Tannenbaum Chat, yeah. Melvin J. Berman Hebrew Academy, and Jewish Community High School of the Bay. Woo! We'd like to thank the judges who are not only here with us today, but who have invested time and thought in reading and providing feedback on your written decisions. I'd like to invite the judges now just to stand and introduce yourselves to the room. Uh, hello, I'm Samara Schwartz. I'm the principal of the Miriam Browning Jewish Learning Center at Congregation Beth Israel. Hi, and I'm Gideon Miller. I'm a local here in Houston, and I'm an accountant. Thank you for being here. The competition will work as follows. Each team will have nine minutes for presentation, and then there will be nine minutes for questions and answers. Our timekeeper is Rabbi Shalom Krell, sitting in the front row. He will give each team a one-minute warning and then a 30-second warning. Even if you are mid-sentence, you must stop. You do not need to use your full nine minutes for presentations, and judges do not need to use your full nine minutes for questioning. There will be a five-minute break in between each team, and then there will be a larger break after, each, after two teams. At the start of the break, the timekeeper will invite the next team to come up to sit up here at the dais. There will also be one large, longer break midway through the competition. After the final team is presented, there will be a lunch break, and the judges will deliberate, followed by a closing ceremony at 12.30 in Sam Houston. For those of you who are watching on live stream, to view the closing ceremony, go to the Prisma CJDS YouTube channel at 12.30. Thank you all, and b'hatzlacha. The first team up is American Hebrew Academy. Kobe Shrell. My teammates are Sammy Goldberg, Jonathan Vlosky, Isaac Ostro, and our coach is Dr. Josh Moss. We are representing the American Hebrew Academy in Greensboro, North Carolina, and we are all grateful to be a part of Move 18 this year. Rachel Rubenstein was using her newly purchased self-driving car produced by Oliva Industries. Witnesses reported that Rachel's car swerved to avoid hitting an unidentified jaywalker and ended up colliding with Shimon Shalom's car in the opposite lane. After his complete recovery, Shimon is suing Rachel for full damages, including medical bills, lost wages, and damage to his car. Rachel claims that Oliva Industries, as the programmer of the car, is responsible. CEO of Oliva Industries, Eli Levine, states that the company cannot be responsible because the car was programmed to minimize fatalities and it performed accordingly. The car swerved away from the jaywalker, and if it hadn't, per the case statement, the result most likely would have been a fatality. In addressing this case, the Beit Din is presented with several halachic issues. One, what type or types of halachic damages are involved in this situation? Two, who is liable to pay for Shimon's damages, medical expenses, and lost wages? And three, should the Beit Din instruct Eli to change the programming used in his self-driving cars because of ethical and halachic concerns, and if so, how? Since autonomous cars are not in classical Jewish sources, we must find a way to classify the leva as one of the four major types of damages given by the Bava Kam, a person, a pit, a fire, or an ox. Through analogies and comparisons, our Beit must make sure to rightly classify the leva. Halakha has established that a horse is an extension of the body, and the driver is personally liable in any accident. This would have been the case if Rachel would have been driving a conventional, non-autonomous car. But, since Rachel was not the driver, and had no control over Oliva, we must consider her a passenger, so the category of a person does not apply. In order to be injured by a pit, an animal or a person must come to the pit and fall over it or trip over it. Unlike a pit, the Oliva moves and interacts with its environment, making the Oliva more active damager. The nature of a fire is that in order to move, an external force, such as wind, must be added, causing damage. The Oliva moves on its own and, and makes calculated decisions. Therefore, a baiting is more similar with an ox than that of a fire. Just like an animal, the leva has final control over its actions. 
A human must direct an animal the same way a human must tell the oliva what the final destination is. After the instructions are given, the oliva, just like an animal, may make independent decisions. Rachel could not override the car. Of course, the oliva does not have Ruach Haim, living spirit, but it is nonetheless self-propelled, purposeful, and has some kind of intelligence. The oliva is also a massive object that moves among the public, making it inherently dangerous, just like an ox. The Mishnah classifies oxen as Muad and Tam, aggressive and innocent. An ox is Muad when he has gored a person, an animal, or an object three different occasions. It is considered dangerous and must be restrained by its owner. If an ox has not been involved in any goring, it is Tam, which allows its owner to give it a certain degree of freedom. In our case, the Leva had never been involved in any previous accidents, which makes it Tam. Rachel was completely justified to allow her car to operate in the public. Even though the Leva had no bad intentions, there were intentions nonetheless, leading our bait dean to assign one half liability to Rachel for damages done by her Tom Ox up to the value of her post-accident Leva. One of the most important questions in our case is who, if anyone, is liable for Shimon's car, for Shimon's damage. We came to a conclusion that there are three parties who may be liable for this case. The Jay Walker, Rachel Rubinstein, and the insurance company. The Jay Walker, which is the primary cause of the accident, is a pedestrian who appeared out of nowhere. Choshen Mishpat says that if a responsible person was endangered by an irresponsible person, the irresponsible person is liable. And in our case, the Jay Walker behaved irresponsibly and illegally causing the, the accident Therefore, the jaywalker is liable. But because we don't know who the jaywalker is, we cannot extract more money from him. Rachel Rubinstein, the second party, must pay half damages only for damaging Shimon's car according to Ilkhon Iskem Amon, which is less than what Shimon asked for. As it says, it is as if the animal damaged the person's property and the owner is liable for only half of the damages from the body of the animal and he is, however, not liable for compensation for unemployment, embarrassment, pain, and medical expenses. For this reason, Rachel is exempt to pay, for, to pay any other costs rather than damages. In addition, according to Baba Kama, Shimon cannot extract more money from Rachel without a proof. Last but not least, the insurance company. Insurance contracts, in general, are confirmed according to Judaism. As Rabbi Moshe Feinstein wrote in Igrod Moshe, that insurance contracts are legitimate means of providing for oneself and one's family. In addition, Baba Kama says that the law of the state is the law. Furthermore, automobile insurance is required by the state of New York where the collusion occurred. Therefore, the insurance company must pay out their policies. The final issue that our Beit Dean has addressed is whether Oliva Industries should change its car's programming. Currently, the Oliva is programmed to minimize fatalities. This idea finds support from the Mishnah, which says that killing one person is like destroying a whole world, while saving one is like saving a whole world. Therefore, minimizing or avoiding death is clearly a logical position. Another ethical model draws from Sanhedrin 73a. The idea that the jaywalker was a pursuer, a rodaif, who endangered others and therefore most deserved to be hit. It is permitted and even required to kill a pursuer to save his victim. While a valid ethical argument, this option cannot be programmed into the oliva because a car cannot determine fault. A third possible model is based upon the view of Rabbi Eliezer Waldenberg in a responsum that it is better to passively kill many than to actively kill one. Per this opinion, the Oliva would have been better off not swerving and thus passively killing the pedestrian than actively causing death or injury. This model cannot be used by the Oliva because the Oliva is always actively responding to its programming and its surroundings. It cannot be programmed to be circumstantially passive or active. Lastly, it could be argued that it is better to die rather than kill. This position, based on Pesachim 25b, would not be viable for Oliva Industries because it would be difficult to sell a car that does not see the lives of its occupants as a priority. Also, Rabbi Akiva taught that your life takes precedence, which is in direct opposition to this opinion. Of these four ethical models, all of which have legitimate halachic backing, 
Only one is a practical model for the car to employ. The model of minimizing fatalities, its current programming, is the best option. Therefore, the programming should not be changed. Application of halakha shows that Rachel's self-driving car is most like a tom ox, doing intentional damage. Therefore, we rule. One, Rachel must pay half of the depreciation of Shimon's car as a result of the accident. The maximum settlement is the post-accident value of her own car. Rachel may pay from her own funds or her insurance policy. Two, Rachel owes no settlement for Shimon's personal injuries and their related costs. Three, the insurance policies of both parties remain fully operative and are in no way hindered by this decision. And four, Oliva Industries will not be required to change the programming of its cars. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the team. And now the judges have nine minutes to ask questions. Sure. Why did you not choose the analogy of fire? The nature of a fire is that it must be moved by an external force. In this case, the leva is able to move on its own and it has intentions. There were no bad intentions, but there were still intentions. A fire can only be moved by something else. It is completely dependent on external forces. At one point, you assigned some fault to the pedestrian. But in your end conclusion, you assigned the driver as the only liable party. Should the absence of the pedestrian impact the amount of money that the driver has to pay? The absence of the pedestrian does not impact the amount the driver or the passenger, in this case Rachel, would have to pay. However, if the pedestrian were to be locatable or we would know who it was, that would add to the amount of compensation that Shimon would receive. So let me ask a different way. If the pedestrian had been located how much would Rachel be liable for? Uh, Rachel's liability stays the same whether the pedestrian was found or not. Rachel is liable as the owner of an inherently dangerous object, which is like an ox, but in this case, it's the self-driving car. So the amount she pays does not depend on the amount that the pedestrian would have paid. Because she's only paying half damages by analogy to the ox? The reason that it's half damages is because it's not because she was the driver. If she was the driver, it would be, she would be liable for much more. However, because just by being the owner of the self-driving car, she's liable for half damages. Would it be different if she wasn't in the car, but she was just the owner of the car? No, it would remain the same. As the owner, she takes responsibility um, for the dangerous object. Okay. Any further questions? No, I think you covered what, I've, what I had. Okay. Thank you so much. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.